Werner, E-R-N-E-R, Spitz, S-P-I-T-Z. You may proceed, Mr. Good morning, Dr. Spitz. Do you tell us, sir, a little bit about just who you are? What, what is your profession, sir? I'm a medical doctor and I'm a forensic pathologist. I know it may take a little while, but I do want to go through your academic training and background. Would you tell me, sir, where you went to medical school and when? I went to medical school at the University of Geneva, Switzerland School of Medicine from 1946 to 1950. And then I transferred to the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem at that time, or the, at that time it was before the State of Israel was established, so it was Palestine until 1948, and then from 1948 it became Palestine, it became Israel. And I graduated from that university in 1953 and received my diploma to practice medicine. Where did you do your internship, sir? I did my internship at that same university where I graduated. And uh, that internship was one year. And then after that year, I did a residency. And that residency was in pathology and lasted for uh, another five years. And then I, during that time, I did a residency in pathology and forensic pathology. Pathology is what is practiced in a hospital where a, a physician uh, examines tissues and body fluids to determine the nature of disease. And if a person dies, then pursuant to request of the next of kin, the, that same doctor can perform an autopsy. Um, usually in hospitals when a person dies and a, an autopsy is performed. That autopsy is for uh, educational purposes so that the doctors understand the mechanism of the disease, the condition that the person died from. Forensic pathology, on the other hand, is the science where uh, a pathologist, he has to be a pathologist first, a pathologist will examine a body usually, not always, but usually, do an autopsy pursuant to the state law. And he does not need a permission from the next of kin. And such a person will uh, usually do an autopsy on what we call police cases. Cases which are suspicious, where somebody dies, where, where there is no medical doctor in attendance, where we don't know why that person died. And usually these are either accidents, suicides, homicides, or uh, natural death. Now, Dr. Spitz, when did you have your first appointment in the world of academia, that is, uh, uh, as a faculty member, do you remember? Yes, uh, I was appointed to um, the, in, let me say this, if I may, in 1959, I came to the United States, and as I came to the United States, I came uh, on a, uh, I was paid by a grant from the University of Maryland, where I held an academic appointment and, and worked at the medical examiner's office in, for the state of Maryland in Baltimore. That was in 1959? That was in 1959. Okay. 
Did, did you subsequently become a member of the uh, faculty in uh, Berlin? In 1961, I think it was, uh, I left this country and worked for two years and three months at the University Medical School of Berlin in Germany. And there I held an academic appointment too at the university. Did you thereafter return to the University of Maryland? Then in, after two years and three months, I returned to the United States, to Baltimore, to the medical examiner's office of the state of Maryland. And at that time, I held an academic appointment. In fact, I was associate professor at the um, um, Johns Hopkins University and also at the University of Maryland. Those basically during the same time, Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland? I held three appointments. I was associate professor at the University of Maryland, an associate professor at, the, at Johns Hopkins University, and I was assistant medical examiner and later deputy chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland at the office of the chief medical examiner. Are you presently associated as a professor with any university? Yes, then in 1972, I went to um, uh, the um, medical examiner's office uh, of Wayne County, which is in Michigan, in Detroit, and uh, I was uh, appointed chief medical examiner there. In fact, that is why I went to Detroit. And also, I was associate professor for a while, and then I was appointed to full professorship at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. I also held an appointment as adjunct professor of chemistry and taught toxicology at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, across the river from Detroit. Are you still associated with the University of Windsor in Ontario, Canada? Yes, I am, but uh, only because uh, I only uh, I think in, in by name or in name because I uh, have not taught there actually probably in the last ten years. Have you been, sir, the medical examiner for or assistant medical examiner for the state of Maryland? Yes, I was assistant medical examiner for the state of Maryland for approximately assistant and then deputy chief medical examiner. And the chief was quite sick, so I've, I was quite active filling in for him uh, for, for approximately 12 years. Have you also been a chief medical examiner for Macomb County in Michigan? Yes, I was. When I first came to Michigan as chief medical examiner for Wayne County, the county of Macomb, which is a little bit to the north of, uh, northeast of Detroit, uh, asked me if I would do their autopsies for them. They had a chief medical examiner, but the chief medical examiner there was not a pathologist. So he needed a pathologist to tell him what people died from and what he thought uh, was the manner of death, meaning homicide, suicide, natural causes, or accident. Uh, so they appointed me to do that work, but then that medical examiner died and I became the chief medical examiner for Macomb County as well. Are you a fellow in the College of American Pathologists, sir? Yes. Are you a fellow in the American Society of Clinical Pathologists? Yes, these appointments now are emeritus appointments. That means uh, I do not have to pay dues anymore. <laughs> well, 40 years enough. <laughs> I'm sorry? Never mind. Are, are you on the board of directors of the National Association of Medical Examiners? I was. I'm not any longer, yes. Are you a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences? Yes. And have Actu you actually, I'm a fellow. A uh, fellow is a 
because I've been uh, associated with the uh, Society of uh, Forensic Sciences for so long, I was appointed fellow, which is a higher level. And are, have you served as vice president of the World Congress of Legal Medicine? Yes, I still do. Are you licensed to practice medicine in the member countries of the European Union? Yes, in all the European countries that are members in the European Union. Yes, that's correct. But I'm also licensed in this country, in Michigan, in Virginia, in the District of Columbia, and in Maryland. District of Columbia meaning Washington, D.C. Right. Have you received recognition and awards in connection with your professional work, sir? I have received quite a number of awards, yes. I don't want to test your memory against mine, so I'll read and ask you some of them, okay? Yes. Did, did you uh, attend and receive an award in recognition for the National Association of Medical Examiners uh, back in 1972? I probably would answer that by saying to you that I really don't remember, but I probably did. <laughs> okay. Have you received various awards from uh, law enforcement communities and activities? Yes, I did. I, these are uh, these awards for from law enforcement is because uh, um, I received awards from local police. Uh, I received awards from the FBI. I received awards from all t various types of uh, uh, law enforcement organizations, primarily because I give courses to them and I uh, give lectures and serve as consultant to them when they ask me to interpret various cases. Would the, uh, that category include the New York State Police? Yes. Wayne County Medical Society? Yes. Sterling Heights Citizens Police Academy? Yes. American. They're, they're not all listed, so okay. don't, you don't need to make an effort. Okay. <laughs> Have you also been consultant, sir, for various organizations and universities? Yes, I have. Are you a special consultant for Johns Hopkins University? Yes. How about the Veterans Administration? That as well. And sir, were you a special consultant for the Rockefeller Commission? Yes, I was. The what, what was the Rockefeller Commission, Dr. Spitz? What that was? Yes, sir. The Rockefeller Commission is the commission of Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, when, of course, when he was alive, and it concerned itself with the assassination of President Kennedy, the uh, reconstruction of the events that uh, occurred that day in Dallas and uh, how the president was killed. Were you also a member of the Forensic Pathology Panel Select Committee on Assassinations so for the United States House of Representatives? Yes, and I testified to the House of Representatives on the issues of the, de the um, assassination of Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. <clears throat> Were you involved, sir, as a professional pathologist in a case involving a young woman named Mary Jo Kopechne? Yes, I testified in a trial. I, may, Your Honor, I, I would have an objection at this point. This goes beyond his uh, training experience in the air of French pathology. This Sustain this to the last question. 
What other major trials, sir, have you been involved in that the folks in this courtroom might recognize you for? Same objection, Judge, instead of those qualifications. Right. Doctor, have you uh, published various articles, books, lectures, publications? I have. Do you know how many? I've uh, published four books, um, textbooks, and uh, the last one was in 2006. Is this one of them? Medical Legal Investigation Yes, that's correct. That's the last, bo the last book. Have you published articles in connection with such things as the mechanism of death in freshwater drowning? Yes, I've published approximately 14 articles related to the uh, subject matter of drowning. And uh, those were published in, uh, as far as I can remember, peer-reviewed journals. And this is part of a, uh, my publication list of where I published 96 scientific articles peer reviewed by other pathologists to determine that they were suitable and recommended for publication. Sir, have you testified as an expert witness in the courts in the United States? Yes, I have. I have testified on what I think, if I, uh, what I think to remember in all 50 states, including Alaska and Hawaii. And have you also testified as an expert in foreign countries? Yes, I have. I have testified in Canada. I have testified in the Middle East. I have testified in Europe. And I've testified in, well, not testified, but I've done work for the United Nations and then given opinions to a court in Costa, in Costa, in, um, in Costa Rica. In just the last seven years update of your curriculum vitae, sir, do you know how many times you've testified as an expert witness? Probably around 300 times. Maybe, maybe somewhat more. I testified probably around 30 times on the average a year, but there have been years in which it was more frequent, so that would probably exceed that number if I, if I actually counted it. Your Honor, I think that's enough. I request the certify and direct the recognition of Dr. Spitz as an expert witness in the field of forensic pathology. What says the state? No objection. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Dr. Spitz will be accepted as an expert witness in the area of forensic pathology. You may proceed. Do you remember, sir, when and how you first got involved or became involved with the case we're here for, State of Florida versus Casey Anthony? I, I, I received a call, I think, from the um, Jose Baez law firm. And what? And I was asked to, to, to possibly, uh, if I agreed, to uh, consult with the firm on this case, and also whether I have special requests uh, that they would. You know, uh, let me object. Is, is hearsay and not responsive to the question of how you first contacted? Sustained. What was the first thing that you did, sir, after speaking with the Baez law firm? I requested 
to attend the postmortem examination because the postmortem examination at that time when I received that call had not been performed. Meaning the autopsy by Dr. Garavaglia? Yes, that's correct. Did you request that you be allowed to be in attendance? Our Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? You may. You may proceed. I think the last question was, sir, did you request to attend the autopsy that Dr. Garavaglia on? Yeah, yes, I did. Were you allowed to? No, I was denied. Why did you want to? Well, because first of all, uh, it's useful to have seen the body in the condition that it was uh, at that particular time. Um, so that I have uh, the same exposure to the body as the pathologist who is performing the autopsy in his or her official capacity. But in addition to that, there is a, uh, an advantage in having two people of uh, the same specialty look things over together because uh, uh, four eyes see more than two eyes and I'm able to discuss the, uh, the um, findings on, on and in the body at the time that the body is there in front of us. Uh, this is custom in uh, forensic pathology. It is custom in pathology. It is custom that uh, even in a hospital setting, pathologists will send specimens from patients to other pathologists Your to Honor, see if... Excuse me, sir. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, not response to the question and relevance of the habits of medical pathologists. Overall. It is customary that pathologists will send specimens from patients uh, dead or alive to other pathologists across the country, sometimes across the world, to see if they concur or if they have ideas about uh, this condition or that condition, because those ideas feature in the treatment that is afforded such patients, maybe life-saving. In a dead person, there is no life-saving, but there is a question of what else can be done to make a reasonable diagnosis that conforms to all the facts of the case. And uh, that was denied, so. Well, thereafter, sir, did you conduct a second autopsy? I did. When uh, the uh, official autopsy uh, was terminated, I was given access to the remains, and I conducted such autopsy uh, at the Bryant Funeral Home and Cremation Service, or I don't know, it's got a longer name, in, uh, located in Orlando, and I was able to perform that autopsy at that place. If you recall, sir, had Dr. Garavaglia completed her report of autopsy before you conducted the second one? I don't really recall. I don't, I don't think so, that she had completed. I don't think she had completed her report. When you conducted the autopsy, what, if any, first observations did you make that were remarkable to you? Well, I came here uh, to, to uh, Orlando equipped with all kinds of equipment to perform an, an, uh, an autopsy, but I did not bring a saw because I was absolutely certain that this autopsy had been completely done. But when I came and I looked at the body, it had not been completely done. What, what had not been done, sir, that you believe should have been done? 
Well, it's not that I should believe, but I think the profession dictates that when an autopsy is done and done the way it should be done, there should be a, an examination of the interior of the head, and that was not done because the skull had not been opened. And did you, sir, open the skull and examine it as a forensic pathologist? I did. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. you open the bag and take the contents out, sir? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Open the bag and take the contents out. And for the record, describe what you have there, sir. Uh, this is a skull, not the skull of this deceased. This is a skull of an uh, adult human being, um, not a um, plastic or fake material. This is bone. And um, I brought this because I thought it necessary that the trier of fact uh, observe Your Honor, what. Not responsive and narrative and not relevant. Sustain, let's give a question. Doctor, would you demonstrate, sir, what you mean by opening the skull, the protocol that you say Dr. Garavella did not do? When a skull is opened, it is opened like I'm opening the skull now. So in other words, a saw is used to saw the skull all the way around and to remove the cap, as it is called, and look at the interior of the skull, like I'm showing here, and like I'm showing here. This is the outside, this is the inside. And it's the autopsy. This is the outside, this is the inside. Dr. Spitzner, an autopsy. Were photographs taken, sir? I'm, I'm sorry? Did you take photographs? I did. I did. May I approach the witness, sir? You may. So you want that to be marked as the Fitz Exhibit B Y for identification? Yes. Does that photograph fairly accurately portray the appearance of the skull? after opened by you for the second autopsy? Yes, it was. Uh, it, it, it is, I'm sorry. It is. Opposition evidence defense. Thanks, Your Honor. I'll give you a copy of it. Okay. It will be received in evidence as defense exhibit numbered... Number 26. With the court's permission, we have a... And in part, same photograph that the department has published this. You may. Mm -hmm. And with the court's permission, may I have Dr. Spitz step down? Yeah, but make sure we put a microphone on it. For me? For both of you. All right. Doctor, you may step down, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. As that's being done, we approach, we don't need to call forward.
Mr. Mason, can you switch places? He'll be over there and you'll be over here. Oh, I'm sorry. That would be better if he stands over there. Over the side? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll stand behind you. I think they can hear me. I don't know. Dr. Spence, is that uh, the enlargement? Uh, Mr. Mason, I, I can't see. If you can see. I'm, I'm trying to get his I, I, I know, but he has to be able to communicate with his witness, so. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, sir. This photograph enlarged here is the enlargement of the one that you took during the autopsy. Yes. Would you tell the court and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what, if anything, is remarkable about the contents of the photograph that we have before them? Well, this is what uh, it represents the uh, base of the skull, the bottom of this box. The lid is here, taken off by sawing all the way around. This is what you then would see if you look into the, the box. And this is where the, the uh, vertebral column, the spine connects, and the spinal cord goes in here and into the brain. And um, this is the front, this is the back. Actually, it should be reversed. Do you want to do it with me? Do it the right yeah. way. Well, yeah. I got it. Yeah, this is it. Okay. So, this is the front, this is the back, this is the right side, this is the left side. And this is the reverse. That means this is the left side because if you flip it over, then this part would go onto here. And uh, what you see here is in this area, which is the left side of the skull, the base of the skull, you see black flecks. These black flecks are material which uh, represent the uh, last uh, and permanent result of decomposition. What that means is uh, that the brain, which fills this entire space, <coughs> is gone. The brain has dissolved, but some parts like iron, magnesium, phosphate, sodium, chloride, all kinds of elements like that remain permanently. They don't disappear. This is ashes to ashes and dust to dust, what you read in the Bible. And this is the dust which is remaining. And this amount of dust would have been probably uh, just less than an ounce. But of course here there is no one ounce because some of this dust has been removed, has gone, I don't know, lost. Um, and uh, could have been um, there could have been water, there could have been whatever, anyway, it's lost. These specks are uh, attached to, they, they came down and they just remained. And uh, they indicate the position of this skull over the um, decomposition process. Decomposition process takes time, uh, quite a lot of time, to end up in just this, uh, representing the specs, to be left over after the entire brain has gone. Uh, so this indicates the brain has d d d uh, disappeared, and 
those elements sunk to, by gravity, to that place. And very little by little by little over months, this has occurred. And it tells you the position of the skull. What was the position of the skull? The skull was positioned in a left side of the skull down. That means if this is the ground, the skull would have been something like this. Show the jury with our friend here, sir, the position that it would have been throughout the decomposition. Well, here is the base of the skull. This and that are the same. And the uh, specks are localized in this area on the left side. And the skull would have been like this, positioned like this. This would have been the position of the skull. Maybe, maybe with the face a little bit, a little bit up, because it seems to be more, somewhat more to the back. So maybe a little bit like this. All right. Thank you, sir. If you can return up there. Has the jury had enough time to look at this? Dr. Spitz, did you review the records and documents contained in Dr. Garavaglia's report of autopsy? I did. What, if any, problems did you detect? Well, you might I'm sorry. Yeah. What if, what if any problems that you detect, sir, or deficiencies in her report? Objection to the, pardon me, to the question of relevancy of deficiencies in reports that weren't testified to in this case and aren't oh, an issue. The uh, entire, I examined the entire skeleton. Uh, there was very little, if any thing, any bones missing. And if there were, there would be little, little bones, uh, little parts, but m most by far of the skeleton was available to be examined. The skull had not been opened, so I opened it and I showed the jury uh, what I saw, what I found. Uh, there are certain things I did not find which could have been there, but I did not find that they were. Like, for instance, some discoloration of certain parts of the skull, uh, like the, the place where the, uh, the ear is, the, the mechanism of the ear, the little protrusion of bone in back of the lower jaw, uh, to the side here, on the side of the skull. Um, and the, law, the mechanism of the ear, which is at the base, which is inside here and there. Um, there could have been some discoloration, which I did not see. There were no fractures, no blows that uh, I could identify on the skull. Uh, there was, uh, the skull was uh, intact, in other words, undamaged. Um, there were the uh, some there was some damage to some uh, bones some long bones being meaning arms and legs and other longer bones which was due to uh, uh, post mortem meaning after death predation by animals meaning where animals find bones with some flesh on them and they go ahead and chew on those parts 
um, that I found. But other than that, other than that, there was no damage. There was a an area of one of the longer bones of the thigh because the thigh is a long, fairly long bone in a child three years old, probably around five inches, maybe. Uh, and that had been opened by those who did the first autopsy. Um, I surmised that they would do, when I saw that that had been opened, I thought, well, they probably opened it in order to take specimens from the bone marrow. And let, let me object to the narrative. I think we've gone away from the question that was answered. I thought that they had uh, done this, opened uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the bone, um, to to get access to the to the um, uh, bone marrow to the bone marrow cavity for the purpose of removing certain material that would be helpful in diagnosis. But I subsequently learned that that had not been the case. Um, so based on this examination, the cause of death remained uh, unknown for those who did the first autopsy, and for me to some extent as well. You recall reading Dr. Yervalia's uh, statement uh, references to duct tape? I understand that there was, uh, there were some sections of duct tape uh, on the uh, lower face uh, that were loosely uh, on the face, but uh, since there was, I should say there was not a shred, I've not said that before, not a shred of soft tissue, no skin, no muscle, no fat, no nerves, no blood vessels, no nothing. So much so that when I came to, to Orlando to handle this, I brought a whole bunch of gloves, I bought an apron, I bought to protect myself uh, from possible contamination. I used nothing because the skeleton that I received was in this condition. And like I touch this now without gloves, without apron, that's how I touch the other one. This is totally clean and there's no bacteria, no nothing to contaminate me from handling this, just, just as little as there was to be contaminated, to be infected or to uh, uh, n not allowing me to handle those remains of this three-year-old child. Consequently, I did not need any of the material that I brought. The um, uh, tape was not there when I got the remains. The tape on pictures shows being to the side of the lower face, somewhere here on the left side, on the right side, if I remember correctly, uh, hanging. The photographs speak for themselves. The jury has seen them and can interpret them for themselves. Overall. Hanging on hair and hanging on roots of vegetation of the area that had in the period where this was sort of in an excavated, in a little um, lower, uh, partially um, um, under the surface of the uh, um, uh, of the uh, ground, um, uh, vegetation had grown into this material. Plants uh, benefit from um, the minerals and chemistry that is generated by decomposition. Dr. Spitz, in the report from Dr. Gavalia, she indicated that the duct tape was clearly placed prior to decomposition. What, if any, opinion do you have regarding that assertion, sir? Well, I have some problem with that. 
because when duct tape is applied to the skin and the skin decomposes, the duct tape just doesn't uh, go anywhere. The, the duct tape just doesn't do anything. The duct tape becomes loose on the, uh, on the, uh, um, on the, on the skeletal structure. On the, in this case, the face. The only thing that held the duct tape there was the roots and the uh, and the, the hair that originally. Um, I don't know in what fashion the the duct tape came in contact with this. There was no there was no duct uh, there was nothing on the bone that would suggest duct tape. There was nothing on the duct tape that would suggest the uh, application on the skin either. So uh, I have some difficulty with identifying when this duct tape was placed, other than to say that it is my uh, strong feeling and opinion that this duct tape was uh, um, perhaps placed there to hold the lower jaw in place. Because if the uh, head is subjected to as complete a decomposition as it did, where there is absolutely no trace of flesh on this head or in this head, if I would have picked this up like, um, like this, the lower jaw would have dropped, just like I'm going to show you right now. Because this is this lower jaw is attached by this would be like this. That's how, well, or like that. I would touch this to remove it and note what happens. the lower jaw falls down. So, uh, being that it fell down, if the duct tape was attached to the skull, it would have been held somewhat by the roots and maybe by um, the fact that there was hair between the duct tape and the lower jaw. And sir, would you have expected there to be DNA on the duct tape if in fact it had been placed over the face? I would have expected DNA, yes. And would that be true whether it was placed? Well, I mean, if, 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 there was, if this was the duct tape was attached to the, uh, um, uh, to the face, there would have been DNA from the face on the duct tape. Uh, I put uh, duct tape on my arm. And when I removed it, I pulled out hair, sometimes with roots, uh, on, from my arm on the duct tape. And based on the... And there is no... Uh, <laughs> No doubt in my mind that if you would have had duct tape on the skin, there would have been some evidence of the presence of that skin DNA on that duct tape. And for the, the simple process. reason, for the simple reason that there is a firm connection between the duct tape and the skin to the point where decomposition is always less in an area of pressure against something, against a wall, against pieces of clothing that are tight, the decomposition is less in those areas where there's no air coming in. Because bacteria also need to live. And bacteria are what, hap what cause decomposition. All right. And then is it your opinion, sir, that the tape was not 
put on the face before decomposition, even antimortal? No, it was not. I think that the uh, duct tape was a later, later event, not an early event. After decomposition. After decomposition. So I'll tell the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury what the term adipocere means. Adipocere is a stage in decomposition when the tissue becomes uh, broken down, slimy, uh, smelly, um, You'll have to excuse me the comparison, but that is the comparison we pathologists use to compare. We are not always very elegant in our descriptions. We call it soapy. It's oh, like butcher. soap. It's like soap. A theory is like soap. It is a special, especially fat undergoes a theory. That is like, um, like soap, broken down to a consistency that is similar to wet soap. Do you have an opinion, sir, as to how long it takes for adipocere to develop? A theory develops at... Can we approach? She might. You may proceed. You ruling? The question to you, sir, was how long does it take for adipocere to develop? Adipocere under optimal conditions. That means under conditions of uh, a warm environment uh, will begin to develop um, so, so such that we can call it adipocere. Uh, within like 10 or 12 days. Did you find, sir, the apparent presence of any adipocere? Oh, no, absolutely not. There was, like I said, there is no more soft tissue on that skull like on this skull, compared to this skull. Based on your review of Dr. Gavalier's report, Oh, hold on a second. You reviewed the whole thing. I'm sorry? You reviewed all of Dr. Gravalier's report? Yes. Including the toxicology report? Including the toxicology. And the anthropology report? Anthropology report. Were you able to determine, sir, if there is any evidence as to the cause of death in this case? Well, there are, you can rule out certain causes of death, but you cannot answer the definitive question as what this person, this child, really died from. She could have died of certain conditions that at this point we don't see. But to, I mean, you cannot rule out all conditions, but you can rule out some. You could, for example, rule out that there was a, uh, um, a skull fracture. There was no skull fracture. And as a medical examiner, would you also reasonably rule out one of the other four, like suicide? Oh, yeah. I, and I would rule out suicide. Can you, from the evidence, sir, rule out accidental death? No. Now, there's a difference between cause of death and manner of death, correct? Yes. What, if any, opinion do you have, sir, as to the manner of death in this case? The manner of death means, like I said already, um, natural causes, accident, suicide, homicide, and natural causes. There are four classifications for manner of death. Cause of death is something else. Cause of death is uh, pneumonia, 
gunshot wound, lots of causes of death. But manner of death, there are only four. Homicide, suicide, natural causes, or accident. So, In this case, do you, do you know what the manner of death is? The manner of death, I could, no, I would not be able to tell you. I, uh, um, based on the examination as it stands today, I could not tell you what, what the manner of death is. Now, sir, finally, do you know approximately how many autopsies you have conducted in your career around the world? I have either conducted or supervised the residents doing autopsies on approximately a total of 60,000. 60,000? 60,000. I have no further questions. For, of... I've been practicing forensic pathology for 56 years. Hang on just one second. Please. No further questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take a 10 minute recess before we proceed with cross examination. All right. Okay, stay recognized, presence of the jury. I do. Defense? Yes, sir. All right, you cross examination. Good. Uh, doctor, if you could kind of turn that screen a little bit, because I can't really see you down there. Thank you. That's perfect. We'll have you look at the screen in a minute, but for right now, that's great. Um, doctor, a medical legal investigation, uh, particularly in determining manner of death, requires consideration of of information outside of merely the medical evaluation of the remains, doesn't it? That's correct. What information about this case, that is the investigation of this case, were you given um, in order for you to render the opinion you rendered on direct examination? Well, so, uh, I was given information of the first autopsy, whatever is included in that autopsy report. I was given information, uh, I was uh, permitted to go to the scene of where the body was found. Um, I went to the house as well, to the house where the, the, the people uh, that have uh, uh, an input into this case resided. The Anthony home. The Anthony yes. home. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, well, that's about it. Well, but uh, in order to do a, an adequate medical legal investigation involving manner of death, you need to know the surrounding circumstances revealed by the investigation, not just the medical aspects, but the I entire background. I understand that. And I, uh, um, asked questions uh, of uh, those who know about the, uh, the case. I asked uh, to give me information that I, I wanted to have, and I received that information. I cannot tell you now each and every question that I asked, but I asked sufficient uh, questions to allow me to um, have a good idea about what I think happened here. Who did you ask? I asked, um, uh, well, Mr. Baez I asked. Uh, I asked uh, Mr. Mason. I asked, uh, well, I think I spoke, if I'm not mistaken, I, I spoke to uh, the people in the home, some of them that I met over there. Who did you speak to? Did you speak to the Anthony's? In the Anthony home. Uh, I don't remember who those, who those people were. Um, did you read any of the police reports? I did have police reports, yes. Oh, okay. Well, you, you hadn't mentioned that. Tell me about yes. the police report. That's right. I had those two. Which ones? I couldn't tell you. I didn't know that there were... Uh, there were tell us what your understanding kinds. of the predicating facts of this case are leading up to the finding of the body. 
What is your understanding? Those facts that you used in uh, your test, your determination and opinion you gave to Mr. Mason on direct. Well, I understand, no. I understand that there was uh, uh, some time, uh, a lapse of time uh, of what a month between uh, the disappearance of the of the child and when uh, uh, the a police report was made. Now, aren't the significance, aren't the facts of the last time anyone saw a victim always extremely important in a medical legal investigation? Yes, everything needs to be evaluated uh, together, but not independently. That's why everything has to be fitting together like a like a jigsaw puzzle. So tell, uh, I'm sorry, are you done? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure you're done with your answer. You, you pause. I want to make sure that you're yes. done before I go on. It, it all needs to fit together. You cannot take one uh, uh, item by itself, but you have to evaluate the entirety of the picture. What is your understanding of the events of the last time that Kaylee Marie Anthony was seen alive? Uh, would you ask me that again? Sure. What is your understanding of the events of the last time Kaylee Marie Anthony, that's the victim in this case, was seen alive? <clears throat> I know that Kaylee Anthony uh, was allegedly uh, taken to a babysitter. Is that what you mean? Just, uh, I just that's want my the, understanding I, that that's uh, something that occurred when I, she was. I just want the jury to know what information you had about the background of this case, which you acknowledge is essential, in coming to the opinion that the manner of death is undetermined, as you expressed to Mr. Mason on direct. I want the jury to know what facts you had in making that decision. So please explain that to us. I don't know that I had any facts on when she was alive. Um, I cannot recall um, information that I had that uh, allows me to, to recite for you what she was doing or what what happening to her when she was alive. Well, then, would you not agree that that Dr. Garavaglia had considerably more information than you do in coming to her opinion that the manner of death is homicide by undetermined means? Well, if she knew that information, I am aware of whatever she put into her report. And that's a fairly lengthy report if you consider all the anthropology and toxicology and microscopy and whatever else is in that report. Uh, but I do not recall any information that she had that I did not have because I read her report. Well, but uh, it's so if you tell me that she read, wrote something in that report that I did not tell you, then well, I had that information and I, I would have read it. So I was aware of whatever the, she wrote in her report, I was totally familiar with. What, what did she write in her report about the predication of this, the last time she was in alive? What, what did she say in that report? Do you recall? What she said? What Dr. Garavaglia said. No, I don't recall. But it, it is common in, in uh, uh, forensic pathological reports to summarize relatively briefly, the facts of the investigation, correct? It's not generally a, a practice to put in every single fact that you may have learned, but rather to summarize them. Well, Isn't some that people do and some people don't. Well, uh, I don't, but many people do. But to do a complete medical legal investigation, one must look to all possible sources of information, at the very least, read the police reports and statements of witnesses to determine exactly what led up to this child dying. That's essential, isn't it? Yes, and therefore we do read police reports. But you've just told us that you don't remember any of the facts of this case or, or no, what happened to her. No, I didn't tell you. That is not, okay. uh, not 
I don't think that's correct. Okay. What do that's you remember? Paraphrasing what I said, I did not say that. I don't recall any of the facts. I do recall uh, facts that I considered significant for me to formulate an opinion. And you asked me what she, what I knew about Le uh, Casey Anthony uh, before she disappeared, before she, uh, before she um, was. Uh, uh, la before before she was last when she was last seen alive and uh, that I do not recall I rec all I recall is that she was a healthy young three-year-old child well let me ask you this way to be fair what do you recall about the facts leading up to her disappearance or death that you considered significant in coming to the opinion you expressed on direct not when she was last before uh, before she was last seen alive well if if, if you did not consider that fact significant, that, that's fine, but tell us what facts you considered significant about the, f the time leading up to her death or disappearance that you felt were significant. Well, I thought that there was a, uh, um, a pool in the house, in the, in, the, uh, in the yard, which I saw when I was there, which creates a possibility of drowning. Um, I, uh, um, understand that for a month, uh, a month went by without uh, informing the authorities that the child is missing. Okay. Do you recall any other facts of significance? No, I don't recall other facts. If you want to remind me of them, I'll be glad to listen. I, I'm just inquiring of the ones that you felt were significant in rendering the opinion that you gave to Mr. Mason on direct, and yes. those are the facts that you found significant. Yes, and the, the, that is a a uh, um, a fact that I uh, understand that she was missing for a month. Now, you also indicated. Um, in direct examination, that the failure of Dr. Garavaglia to um, open the skull was a violation of protocol. Correct. What protocol is that? The protocol is that we have here a, an autopsy on a child that has um, uh, was the ultimate uh, examination by a forensic pathologist in a case that had uh, national, um, made national news. Um, the, uh, um, we open the head in... Uh, Your objection, non-responsive. The question was what protocol was violated? Doctor, do you understand the question? Yes, I understand the question, Your Honor. Okay. So what protocol was violated? The protocol is that the head is opened uh, in any individual where there is a uh, possible involvement of the uh, skull, the meninges, the uh, brain, and any structure that would theoretically benefit from a uh, skull um, uh, examination, from a, a, an, an opening of the skull. Let me say this, that the skull, the head, is part of the body. And when you do an autopsy, you examine the whole body that's just like when you buy a house, you buy a whole house, not a house without a basement. Uh, if you want to have a house without a basement, maybe you can find one. But in general, you buy a whole entity, and that contains a living room, a dining room, a bedroom, with this kind of stuff. And it's a complete structure. The, the body is a complete structure. The head is an Im extremely important item in all this. There can be all kinds of things in a head that occur that you need to know about. You mean to say that I examine only from the head down? The rest is of no significance? Doctor, what I'm asking you is, where is this protocol published? 
that there she is no violated. publication. This is part of the of the. Uh, um, I cannot. I, I don't know where that is published, but I do know that I have been trained, and I have trained uh, lots of uh, uh, medical examiners to practice forensic pathology, and there is somewhere that I'm aware of because I was a member of the committee that made that document that what we should examine. But I don't know what that's called. I've been out of the mainstream of uh, uh, um, administrative forensic pathology uh, for some time now. Uh, but uh, to not open the head, I think, is a failure. A failure of the autopsy. And I'll tell you another thing, that if an autopsy uh, was done in a uh, corresponding to what I think every forensic pathologist will tell you, uh, where the head is not opened, that tells me about a shoddy autopsy. Excuse me the expression, but you provoked it. Uh, a shoddy autopsy, because if the head is not opened, what else wasn't examined? Sorry, I apologize. I didn't mean to provoke you. Yeah, it is. Uh, my, it, 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 it upsets my better knowledge, my better understanding of my profession that I've now practiced for 56 years. That somebody would uh, do an autopsy. You know, let me let me object. Excuse me, sir. I would object to the narrative and not responsive to the question. Let's have another question. Thank you. So, this. A skull is opened in a traditional autopsy of a non-skeletonized remains in order to examine the brain within the skull and the structures within the skull. Isn't that the reason? No, that is one it, reason, but it's not the only reason. Okay. What's, what other reasons are there? Well, each, each case beckons a, a certain... Uh, examination of certain things within that same location, namely the skull and what else is there. I would never have known how this head was positioned, for example, um, if I didn't open it. Well, we'll, we'll discuss that in a minute, but, but what I want to establish is there's also a protocol for autopsy that uh, requires the opening of the chest by, is it cutting the ribs along the sternum? Well, you're not going to have access to the chest organ if you're not going to open the uh, ribs just as little as you're going to have access to the brain if you're not going to open the head. So certain protocols apply to, that apply to non-skeletonized remains don't apply to skeletonized remains because you can see what's in there because everything else is gone, correct? No. You mean you can look inside the head without opening it? Yeah. Well, you have to show me how to do that. There's a little hole right in the bottom. I'm sorry? Isn't there a little hole right in the bottom? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll withdraw the question. Now, um, are you aware of any, you're aware of this book, correct? Yes, uh, somewhat, yes. Well, you, you I mean, edited I, it and wrote some of it. Exactly. And this is a, compilation of articles on virtually every subject in the area of medical legal investigation of death. Isn't that correct? Well, oh, I'm sorry. A, the medical uh, legal investigation of death by Spitz and Fisher, the same book that Mr. Mason asked about a moment ago. It is a textbook in forensic pathology. And it, it contains um, articles on virtually every aspect of medical legal investigation. Some of them you wrote yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, I wrote most of the trauma chapters. There's chapters on forensic anthropology. Yes. And those are written by uh, William Bass, of, that we've heard, whose name we've heard a number of times in this case. There's uh, articles on forensic entomology. Yes. Written by uh, Neil Haskell, correct? That's correct. Now, sustain at this point, if you're going to use an authoritative would you agree that this is an authoritative treatise on the medical legal investigation of death? Yes. May I approach the witness? Yes. Turn my microphone on. Can you show me where in this book 
it establishes a protocol that requires the opening of a skull in a skeletal case. So this is not a book on protocols. This is a, pro a book which talks about findings that, and interpretations of wounds and what happens to a person after death and things of that nature. This is not an, a book that uh, tells you uh, about how to do an autopsy. It tells you how to interpret uh, injuries. And you will find by reading this book that the head is opened in, in just about every uh, type of autopsy one performs because it shows you injuries in the head. And to find those injuries, you need to open the head. And in the chapter on forensic anthropology written by William Bass, does it contain a protocol which suggests that the skull must be opened in the... Yeah. Six, nine, eight, nine. Oh, that I, uh, Mr. Mason, you need to repeat your objection. The court reporter did not hear it. I'm sorry. I'm a, objecting to the prosecutor's efforts in violation of 611 regarding bolstering of his witnesses or attempting to. Overall. The, the question was the chapter on forensic anthropology in this book that you edited. Yes. Does it contain any protocol or requirement that the skull be opened in a skeletal case. This is, sir, this is not a book on protocols. It probably doesn't say that the, the head needs to be opened in anywhere in this book, because it is, it, but it does talk about injuries and findings in a, uh, in a head that occurred during lifetime and in order to find those things, those manifestations, the head needs to be opened. So whereas it doesn't say that go ahead and open the head, it talks about the findings in that head which require the head to be opened. Now, are you familiar with uh, something called the Minnesota Protocols? It's a UN document. The full title of the document for counsel's benefit is Manual on effective prevention and investigation of extra legal, arbitrary, and summary executions, specifically section five, titled Model, Pro Model Protocol for Disinternment and Analysis of Skeletal Remains. Are you familiar no, with this I document? Know, I know nothing about that. If you can, maybe you can tell me who wrote that. Um, it indicates it was drafted in consultation with lawyers for the Advocates for Human Rights, formerly the Minnesota Lawyers International Human Rights Committee. This manual, which supplements the principles I'm sorry, of effective prevention and investigation of, well, actually, let me make a report and have, let him read it. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for coming if you're familiar with it. <laughs> You know, this is written by lawyers, for lawyers, and as I said, by lawyers. It's written in legalese. I don't understand it. Would I'm you, not a lawyer. Would you Never read, have been a lawyer, and I don't know how even to understand this document. Would you read the, uh, I think it's three or four pages in, it's uh, section five, the model protocol for the... Uh, Objection, Your Honor, is improper effort to impeach with a non-recognized, non-authoritative source. I'm just trying to determine whether he, he recognized it, not read it out loud, but read it to himself. He's already said he didn't recognize it. Sustained. He's indicated he does not recognize it. Well, I just thought he might, if I may have him just, just to himself review that section five to see if he re recalls that section as opposed to the lawyer ease part. Okay. Look at that section, Doctor. On, I, would you show me which section that sure. is? You might. It's 
section title five. Just read a few seconds. And some of you who recognize never having seen it. No, I've never seen it. I can tell you that. All right. Yes. So, Doctor, it would be fair to say that when you, on direct examination, said that Dr. Garavaglia's failure to open the skull violated protocol, what you really meant was it violated the way you think it should be done, correct? No. So there's no written protocol anywhere, correct? I did not say that. I am not aware of a protocol, but I can, I can assure you that investigation of the head is part of a complete autopsy. And that we are dealing with a need for a complete autopsy in a nationally, un, a nationally uh, um, in a case of nas national significance, because this is shown on all televisions and uh, newspapers, and they all talk about this case. And therefore, wouldn't you think that an autopsy is required to document all the findings and not only those below the head? Now, you, you've said that twice, actually pointed out the high profile nature of this case. That's a significant fact to you, isn't it? W which one? The fact that this is a high profile case of you said national significance. That's a significant fact that is to you, a isn't high it? Pro of course it is significant. It is significant that, you, uh, that the pathologists recognize that this case maybe uh, requires more um, questions to be answered than somebody, somebody 85 who is found dead in bed from a heart disease. So you think that the fact that this is a high profile case means that it should be done differently than somebody that nobody knows or nobody cares about. Is that what you're no, telling us? No, that's not what I'm saying, sir. There is no case which nobody cares about because there are always relatives, there are always people who want to know, and there are people in this case that want to know. And they not only the people in the family want to know, but the police want to know, and the People in the street want to know. That's why the television broadcasts it. That's why it's high profile. But that's not the only reason why you open the head. You open the head because that belongs into a complete autopsy. How many media interviews have you given about this case since you were hired? How many? I have given one interview that... Uh, uh, was for a local station here in Tampa, in, in uh, Orlando. And then somebody called me from a local paper in Detroit and uh, asked me uh, about my coming down to Orlando. That's it. Didn't you do an interview with a Detroit TV station as well? I think it's TV6 out of Detroit this very week. On, on which station? Out of Detroit, your hometown, uh, out of Michigan, I should say, up where you live. Didn't you do an interview that was televised on the local TV station up in Michigan where you're from this week? That's the only, that's the one that I mentioned to you. That's the only uh, interview that I gave for television on this case for the uh, uh, local consumption here in Orlando. I gave it in Detroit, but it was broadcast to Orlando and, and br they broadcast it here and, on, in Orlando. But that, in addition to that, I, um, uh, the, the, a newspaper learned, the Detroit News learned that I'm coming down to uh, Orlando and called me and asked me when I'm going and what I'm going to do and so on. So that is what the extent of my media response to this case. Well, you gave an interview to a gentleman by the name of Tony Pipitone. I think he's, well, he's not here today. Ask your question, sir. C certainly. Then you also gave an interview this week to a female reporter for a local station in Detroit, didn't you?
Yes, I think I did. That was also in response to, I don't think that there were a lot of facts in that case described about, or any facts about this case. There was mostly, mostly a logistic that I'm actually going down. There were all kind of other issues discussed in that, in that interview. You don't recall in that interview with the female reporter for the local station discussing at length your testimony in this case, your theories about brain dust, your theories about tape application, you don't about remember what discussing application? about tape being applied to the skull. You don't, I don't remember recall having that. You know, this was brought, that's correct. I did talk to her, but I don't remember what I talked to her about because this was shown, and I was meaning to watch it, and then I fell asleep as I as it was being aired. Believe me, I can sympathize after this week. Uh, but you were also on the Today Show back in June of two thousand nine, were you not? Giving opinions about this case. I don't recall that. You recall being featured on 48 Hours on a nationally televised show about this case. No, I don't remember that. You like high profile cases, don't you, Dr. No, Spitz? No, I don't like or dislike. I, I look at a case to render opinions about that case. But whether it's a high profile case, every case to me is high profile. You were involved That's in- That's why I opened the head in every case. Were you involved in the Phil Spector case out in California? In the Bill Spe in the uh, Phil Spector. Spector case? Yes, I was. You were involved in O.J. Simpson? Yes, I was. Were you involved in the Menendez brothers case no. out in California? No. Didn't get that one? No. Now, let's talk about the um, residue in the skull. Where, um, that exhibit? <laughs> now, oh, one, one other question. What's the exhibit? Oh, I'm sorry, it's exhibit AZ. Is this not an evidence? Oh, I, it's a blow up of oh, one that is. Defense 26. Okay, thank you. Um, just for, as a parenthetical, when you opened the skull, you actually broke it, didn't you? When I opened the skull, what? You broke it. I break. I broke it. Yes, when you open the skull, you broke it. Didn't you, Doctor Spence? I didn't know that I broke it. Look, can can you see the big crack in the skull right right here? Yes, there is a break there, but I didn't I didn't do that. I don't know that I did that. Oh, okay. Um, this residue that's in the skull that you're relying on for your opinion, um, did you have that um, tested, chemically tested? I did not do any chemical tests. What I did was I uh, scraped some of that and gave it to um, I, ke I uh, uh, kept it for possible testing. Uh, then I was told that this was tested by um, uh, the county or the, um, the, the, I don't know who tested it, but uh, the, uh, I, I, as far as I understood was that it was, uh, it found its way to the police that they tested it or some police laboratory tested who it. Who told you that? I don't remember who told me that. Well, my, my point is, doctor, you don't really know whether that debris, whether that um, residue is brain dust or just dirt, do you? No, that's not dark. That is debris because it is part of, that is the, uh, uh, the settlement of uh, a decomposing brain and surrounding soft tissues by gravity, that's what this is. This is, believe me, that, please believe me, that this skull of uh, Casey Anthony. You mean Kaylee Anthony. Kaylee Anthony is not the first decomp decomposed skull or um, but Dr. Spitz de decomposed to remain, skeletal remains that I've opened and found this kind of a residue. 
This is a routine finding, and it's mentioned in my book that these things occur and should be examined. Now, but without examining it, you can't truly know whether it's brain dust or just dirt. I mean, isn't that true? No, this is not just dirt. This is the uh, residue from a decomposing brain. And it goes by gravity to the lowest point. That's what this is. Now, did you get uh, information about the nature of the area where this skull was found? I went there. And you would agree that it's a area that is, well, were you uh, given information that this area is an area that is at least occasionally underwater based on the seasons? Yes. I understand that too. All right. So if this skull were underwater, are you telling us that there's not a possibility that that residue that you identify as brain dust is simply sediment from sediment water? Of, yes, it is a sediment. That's correct. It's Sedi a sediment of the brain decomposing and falling to the lowest point. It couldn't be sediment from dirty water that infiltrates the skull as it sits underwater. You know, this uh, is, uh, this sediment is so common in, in skeletal remains that have been subjected to extensive decomposition of the brain and soft tissues that it is almost as definitive a finding as to say that here, this is the lower jaw. I don't need to research the background of this to say that this is the mandibular bone in an elderly individual, a human. So this, I don't need that because this speaks for itself. The so same as this speaks for itself and the same as that speaks for itself. So you don't need to bother to actually have the sediment examined by a chemist or a geologist or a mineralogist or anyone else. You know beyond any doubt that that's brain sediment and not just dirt. That's what you're telling us. Well, if somebody would analyze it, that would be fine with me. Until such time that they analyze this, that is my opinion. That's All correct. Right. Now, you do realize that the, um, it's my mic. the interior of the skull was washed with saline by the medical examiner and a toxicologist to see if they could get any trace um, elements that might have remained on the on the uh, skull through decomposition. You're aware of that? I'm aware that the uh, medical examiner took uh, salty water, so-called saline, put it in through uh, this uh, open, this hole, where I put my, my finger or where I put my, my pen, and um, then swished it around and removed whatever came back. So is it your testimony that there's absolutely no possibility that that act of swishing water is why there's no sediment on this side of the, of the skull? No, the reason that there is no sediment on the other side is because that sediment has a weight to it. As I told you, this is not the first skull that I've examined. In fact, I uh, was able to solve a murder case in California in a Objection, similar... not response to the question. Sustain. <coughs> Which objection, Judge? Mr. Oh. Mason's okay. objection. All right. Go ahead, Doctor. You can finish. Uh, I uh, was requested by the prosecutor of Riverside County, California, to uh, um, uh, examine a skeleton from Riverside that was buried in the mountains of Riverside and to determine the cause of death. And I opened the skull and lo and behold, there was the same residue as here 
sedimented down to the bottom and I found it loaded with sleeping, medica uh, sleeping drug medication and on chemical analysis. That yeah. is why the finding here was of such importance. It indicated when I looked at the skull, I determined that the skull must have been on the left side. Otherwise, that wouldn't be there. So, uh, if you tell me that there was brown sediment everywhere, well, this brown sediment obviously does not respond to the to the uh, um, swishing of the fluid. The this sediment stayed put. Why did it stay put? Because it's sticky. It is sticky in the other cases that I've examined also, and it sticks to the bone. That's why it's there now, but in and the that's why it will be there for probably longer period yet. But in the other case, you sent the sediment for chemical analysis, didn't you? I'm sorry? The California case that you were telling us about? Yes. You sent that residue for chemical analysis. Well, that's because Did there was not? somebody to give it to and that from the prosecutor's office that picked it up. That is one of the advantage of two people doing an autopsy together. Because if that Objection, skull had, Your Honor, not responsive to the question. Oh, Go ahead, you can because finish. Because if I had been there with Dr. Garavaglia, I would have insisted that I would have told her, you know what, let's take that and send it to the laboratory. Then we wouldn't have all this kerfuffle about ex uh, determining what is what when you inject fluid into a closed box, swish it around, and then now, now we are arguing about whether, where it came from or what it was. But if you had had the residue analyzed, we also would avoid the kerfuffle. But I don't, I'm not a laboratory. I don't have a laboratory like that. I, have a la I, I can do autopsies, but I'm not a chemist. I don't do tests like that. that the laboratory does that. Could, could you put your skull back together when I ask you a couple questions and use that skull? Okay. You, I want, you want me to put that back together? Can you put it back together? Sure. And may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Do I need to put this back too? Yeah, please put it back because we're going to talk about the whole run. Actually, if you just want to put it in place, I don't know if we can get any spring action to work if it's possible to put it in place without it. Now, your theory is that this skull decomposed on its left side or right side? Left side. So... With the face slightly elevated. Okay. So slightly like, slight, No, slightly uh, at an angle. Slightly like this. Slightly like that. Yeah. All right. Now, if this, at the time, I'll hold it. At the time of decomposition, when the skull gets in this position, the brain is still at least relatively intact, in your opinion, correct? Yes. The, uh, the skin is still on the face. Yes. The hair is still on the skull. Yes. Correct? Yes. As it decomposes, everything decomposes together. Correct? Yes. yes. The brain is decomposing. Yes. And the skin is decomposing. Right. And the hair is sloughing off the skull. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. And by force of gravity, the hair would naturally fall this way. Correct? No, the hair, well, um, well, the hair would move, but whether it would directly fall, I'm not so sure that it falls. Well, uh, the hair is, um, the hair kind of is clumped together in clumps, and much of the tissue uh, is. Uh, Get, receives some of that creamy, soapy uh, stuff that keeps the hair together and so that even when that eventually disappears, the hair would stay put on the skull. 
the hair would stay put on the yeah, well it would though. move you would then then people come and move it and as soon as you touch the thing it the hair gets moved along too and doctor if, if you if you could not interrupt my question so i'll get it out and then wait the court report's not going to have a have a problem now so you're saying that the skull in this position and the skin has completely decomposed the brain is completely decomposed but the hair is still on the skull well, much of it, it probably would be, yes. But but most of it would have fallen, correct? Well, only that hair that would be on the left side may, may so-called so fall. If you the hair that's on the right side will stay put. And you can see that there are structures on the head that would hold the hair, like here, the maxillary bone, that would hold it in place. That but, would, the, the, would The hair would be entangled in that, some of it. But the mass of hair on the top of the skull would fall but not from the right side. It wouldn't go, the hair doesn't go up. The hair goes by gravity, it would go down, not up. And what comes down from here, it would encounter this structure, and it would encounter that structure on the other side too. I understand that. What I'm asking you is about the mass of hair on the top of the skull would be expected to fall this way. Some of it would fall that way, some of it would not. Well, you would expect if you found the skull in this position, that the mass of the hair would be on this side? Not no, no, that's not so. That doesn't happen. So well, where would it be then? It would. Some of it would be stuck to the top and stuck to the right side. There would be hair. It certainly wouldn't fall off the back, though. The hair from the back may. Some of it may be spread to the back when the skull is picked up. That hair would probably, being that it is resting on some of the shrubbery there, would stay on the shrubbery because it comes in with that sticky material that's on it. Two nineteen. Make sure we're Doctor, do you recognize oh can you turn your screen so you can see it? That one right there. I'll show you a photograph. Do you recognize this as a photograph, uh, one of the medical examiner's photographs, of the appearance of, of Kaylee Anthony's um, skull and remains um, at the, at the um, medical examiner's office? Yes. And may I publish, uh, this is in evidence, may I publish, Your Honor? May. Now, you would agree, oh, okay. always forget about the delay. Thank you, sir. You would agree that the mass of this hair, the vast majority of the hair has fallen back, not to the side. Wouldn't you agree? Sir, you're looking at this picture shows the skull like this. Correct. Uh, like this. Yes, sir. And the hair mass has fallen to the back of the skull, not to the side. Isn't that shown in this photograph, Doctor? The Smith? hair is the hair that she has long hair, and the hair has is sitting on the base of the skull. If you look at this, the back of the base of the skull has, and the sides here, has hair. And the hair is sort of glued or sticky to the bone. That is that hair which matted itself to the skull when the skull was placed, or when the head was placed in that location. But you would agree that this and, photograph and, 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 excuse indicates, me, excuse, excuse me, me, sir, Mr. D Dr. Spitz, if you need to, let me finish the question. You would agree that this photograph shows that the hair mass has fallen backwards, not to the side. Wouldn't you agree, sir? The hair on this picture, location-wise, speaks for itself, where it is. And much of that hair is on the base of this skull. Like here, let me show you. If this is the matted hair, 
<coughs> if this is the matted hair, This is the matted hair. The skull is like this, and the hair would be here, here, and here. Just that's what you are seeing. So your that's rec what you are seeing. The, your recollection. Let me, let me show the, the, the gentleman, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you would see. So you would see doc that that is what this picture shows. Doctor. So is it your statement that the photographs show that there is hair, a considerable amount of hair on top of the skull, that it hasn't all fallen, almost all fallen to this back and the sides? I don't see any evidence on this picture of what you call fallen hair. This hair is matted and is, uh, you tell me that there's water, maybe the water washed it, to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, washed out, the water washed around it and splashed the hair onto the bone and wetted the, uh, the liquefied skin, scalp, to, and, and, uh, to the bone and attached it to the, to the bone, glued it to the bone. So the water displaced the hair, maybe, but it no, didn't I, displace the residue. I don't know if that's what happened, but that could have happened. Let's see. And it seems quite likely because that that happened because there is no hair on the base of the skull. So now there is hair on the base of the skull, on the outside, on this surface, on the outside. How did that hair get there? There is no other way for the hair to get there. The hair can't just slough off the skull when the skin which held it to the skull has decomposed and no longer exists. The hair is, the hair, in order to not exist, it, it underwent uh, a process like adipocere or melting down, breaking down, and that yields materials which are sticky. Did you look at this hair? On the pictures. Do you know whether it's sticky in its present condition? Well, I know that it's sticky because I've examined other hair, not this hair, but uh, I mean, that this is, a, that is a fact that this hair was not located in a clean, what we call clean environment. This hair was subjected to decomposition and when decomposition finishes, the uh, dried up uh, adipocere is still there and helps stick the hair to the bone. You would agree, however, that this photograph does not support the position that you have theorized the, decom the had decomposed it. Because no, the hair has not slid to the side. No, you know, I don't see why that contradicts it. This is to be expected. If you have, you said about uh, this area is uh, submerged at times, and that would be totally consistent with it. Now, let us proceed now to your other theory about the duct tape. Is it your opinion that the duct tape was applied to the skull after it was fully skeletonized? It is my opinion that the duct tape was stuck on there after the skin had um, de deteriorated, after the skin was um, decomposed. Uh, 
How did uh, through someone... the whole process of adipocere, through you see the skeletonization here. You see it. It's looking at you. It's looking at me. Uh, it, it's almost in this condition, except it's uh, not been handled. My, at least not much uh, at the scene. There's debris. There is uh, all kind because that area is full of debris. No, no, may, obje may object to the narrative. It's not responsive to the question I asked. Dr. Ed, you finish answering the question, sir? I have, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, how did this person do that? Describe for the jury how, in your opinion, this person actually did that. Put duct tape on the skull. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. How the person uh, did what? How this person that you have hypothesized put duct tape on the skull, how they did it. Well, they took a piece of uh, duct tape in a roll. It comes in a roll. I'm sorry I didn't bring you a roll to show you. I have a big roll in my office. And uh, tore off a number of uh, uh, seg sections, uh, maybe this long, and stuck them on the, the uh, uh, skull. To, uh, to possibly to do what I did so that um, I can show it with springs attached the lower jaw, the, that is the, yeah, the lower jaw to the rest of the face. Well, uh, let me start with the first level. Is it your theory that the, your theory is that the skull and the body decomposed at the location where it was found but on its side, do I have that correct? On its left side, yes. All right. Did the person, in your opinion, come over and pick up the skull from the ground? Is that your theory? You mean, I, I don't know if, it, if the, the duct tape was applied when the, uh, the skull was on the ground or whether the duct tape was um, elevated when that was done. That I cannot tell you. Well, how could, how could, I mean, if, I'm if, a fairly good forensic pathologist, but I cannot tell you an answer to that question, whether it was uh, uh, elevated or whether it was on the ground. Well, if the skull is on its side, someone would have to pick it up in order to place duct tape over the front going to the sides. Maybe, correct? maybe, may, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, yes, well, maybe no. Well, and when they picked up the skull, the, the mandible would have stayed where it was, correct? The mandible would have what? In other words, when they picked up, if the body is completely skeletonized, then the mandible and the skull are not connected, correct? Well, they are connected until the skull is moved around, and then they're not connected. Right. It's not connected because the soft tissues that hold the skull uh, to the lower jaw, those are gone. So it's like I said earlier, when I picked up this, this uh, skull, the mandible, um, the lower jaw, which is the mandible, fell down here on my back. Exactly my point. He had to pick up, this person had to pick up the skull and then pick up the mandible because they would be separated, correct? Unless you want you use duct tape and stick it back on. But he hasn't duct taped it yet. We're getting there. Well, okay. He picks up the skull. He picks up the, the mandible. Yeah. This person then would need to place the mandible back in anatomical position in the skull. Isn't that correct? Possibly. I don't know how well it, it was attached. According, I, will, I, I don't know. They, in the pictures that I see here, there is no mandible on this picture anyway. Correct. But do you recall from the report of the autopsy and the forensic anthropologist that when it was found, the mandible was in virtually its anatomical position? Right. So this person would have had to take the jaw put it back in anatomical position, correct? Yes. He then would have had to have taken a piece of duct tape and placed it around the bone itself. On one side. Well, do you recall from your readings that the duct tape is on both sides? The pictures don't show it like that. 
I don't have a picture. Maybe you can. You have a picture. I don't remember a picture that shows it on both sides. The, I, we'll just take for purposes of my hypothetical that it's on both sides, and the jury will see the photo has seen the photographs already. So he would have had to take. Here's another point. If you're trying to attach the mandible to the, to the skull, you would have to do it on both sides, correct? If your theory is correct. Well, that, you know, that depends on how long the duct tape is. I don't uh, know whether it was on both sides. I remember it on one side and uh, one side, the other side, there was no duct tape that I could see. But, but if, if you tell me that there was duct tape on both sides, so okay, so there was on both sides. But if your purpose, as you've hypothesized, is to connect the jaw to the skull for some reason, you'd have to do it on both sides. If you want a better bond, yes. yes. This person actually, though, would have done it with three different pieces of tape. Were you aware of that? I know that there are three uh, pieces of duct tape. So why would it take three pieces of duct tape to stick the mandible to the skull if, in fact, that was what you wanted to do? Well, because there was, as what I gleaned from the pictures again, there were two pieces of duct tape superimposed one on top of the other, and the uh, uh, pe pieces were not terribly long to reach the other side, so maybe they were, one side was done and then there was another piece of duct tape put on top of that so that that would extend the le total length of the duct tape to afford it to be on both sides. For purposes of our discussion, um, you may accept that it, the pace pieces were six to eight inches long each and there were three. For purposes of it our discussion. It was what? Pardon? It was what? Each piece was six to eight inches long and there were three pieces. There were three pieces. One piece was like nine feet away, I understand. Yeah, the fourth piece was nine feet away. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this person would have taken this skull for whatever reason and cut three pieces of duct tape and wrapped it around the skull, actually putting the adhesive on the skull itself. This is your theory, correct? Yes. Why is there no glue residue on the skull? There is no glue residue on the skull. There was no residue of uh, uh, duct tape on my skin that I put on directly on my on when I put duct tape on my forearm. There was hair on it, but there was no glue. But but this is bone, not skin. So why so is it? Why would it bone? Why would bone be any different? In fact, bone would is much more. Uh, solid and dense than skin. So why wouldn't, uh, if, if it is, there isn't any on skin, why wouldn't there, why would there not be any, why, w why would there be the residue on bone? You do realize that the duct tape was not actually stuck to the bone when it was found. You, you do realize that. I realize that, yes. Why? That's why it was? Uh, why isn't the duct tape, under your theory, still stuck to the bone. It's not stuck to the bone. But why isn't the it? Pictures don't show it's stuck to the bone. But why isn't it? Well, because there's, a, there's intervention of water. The water will usually uh, um, uh, remove some of the glue, the stickiness of the glue. So why not? So if this person removed the skull attached the mandible to it and put three pieces of duct tape on it and then set it back where it was. Is that your theory? Or take it with them and then bring it back and put it back to where it was. Or to take it back, take it to where he or she uh, wants to put the duct tape and then bring it back and put it back in the, in the place. Then why is the hair the only thing that stuck to the tape? But the hair would stick to the tape. Uh, but you said that the tape was put on after the skull was removed. So how can the hair be stuck to the tape? 
I don't know how Dan how uh, um, uh, how the term. Uh, stuck to the tape is is um, is applicable here because I'm not so sure that it actually that the tape was really still in a uh, condition that it enables uh, stickiness that it uh, preserved the the um, uh, the tape preserved the um, uh, stickiness through this entire ordeal. Heat, uh, water, that takes away some of the stickiness. For, uh, uh, for purposes of our discussion, yeah. would you accept, or do you recall from the autopsy report that Dr. Otz, the doctor that removed the tape, had to cut the hair in order to remove the tape because the hair was stuck to the tape? Does that sound familiar? Well, some of this, yes, I did. Some of this hair is probably st there, and some hair will probably not be there. So some of the hair she may have had needed to cut, and some of the hair she did not need to cut. Could I have a state's exhibit 215 and publish to the jury, Your Honor? You may. You see this photograph, Doctor? Yes. And then this person who picked up the skull, attached the mandible, attached three pieces of duct tape, put it back, then had to drape strands of the hair over the skull. Is that your theory? See, would you say that again? Because sure. I don't understand what your question has to do with this picture. Do you see the strands of hair that are on top of the skull? Yeah, they're just lying there. Your theory is these, that... These pieces of hair, excuse me, these pieces of hair were put there. They did not stay like that. They were put there. Yes, the, the, the person who took this picture or the person who prepared this picture for the photograph to be taken put the hair there. So your testimony is that the medical examiner's personnel took the hair that was not on the skull and placed it there for the purposes of this photograph? Wouldn't be the first time, sir. Wouldn't be. I can tell you some horror stories about that, where people sat in jail for, for a long time because of uh, somebody removing bloody clothes and putting them in the trash can, and those were police officers. May I publish State's Exhibit 209 to the jury? You may. Do you see this photograph, Dr. Yes. Spitz? Do you right. recognize this as a photograph of the skull as it, it was found at the scene? Yes. And do you see the strands of hair draped over the skull? Yeah, but this does not look like, yes, I do. But I do not see that. This picture is identical with the picture that you just showed me. Is it your testimony that the medical examiners who took this photograph at the scene took the hair and draped it over the skull for purposes of this picture? It is my opinion that somebody did. I don't know if it's medical examiner or not medical examiner. I cannot tell you that because I don't see fingerprints on this. But if you compare this, this picture with the other picture that you just showed me, they look different. And why do they look different? Because somebody rearranged it. Redirect. Dr. Spitz, you were asked a little while ago by Mr. Ashton if there were any other reasons for opening the skull than the general autopsy protocol. Do you remember that question? Yes. Were there other are there other reasons why you would open the skull? Sure. And what are they, sir? Well, first of all, just for um, uh, to mention, there, if you look at medical legal investigation of death, I, can't, I don't remember the page number, obviously, but there are occasionally fractures that will not fracture the outside of the skull. So what does that mean? That mean, means that here the skull put back together, 
if there is, let us just for the sake of argument, if this kind of a force is applied to the skull, of the skull, for instance, you can find when you open the skull, you can find a fracture on the inside, but nothing on the outside. That's one. The other uh, in, uh, thing is that in a case of, um, uh, uh, in certain types of death, there would be hemorrhage to the, uh, uh, in certain locations on the base, in the base of the skull. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, in the area of the middle ears, in the areas of the, uh, uh, this bone here behind the uh, lower jaw, which would contain a uh, coloring that's in the bone that is difficult to remove uh, from blood that had accumulated there, which is not here, did not occur in this case. What, and, what, uh, another thing. Me, Doc, what, what types, other types of death would cause that hemorrhaging and discoloration by blood on the base? Well, it doesn't occur each time, but in, in a good number of times, there's hemorrhage in those locations in cases of asphyxiation by smothering or by strangulation. And, and how does that occur? Well, because if you smother somebody, the blood pressure goes up in the head area, and then blood vessels break, and that's the location where you get the evidence. So in many occasions, if there is a suffocation, an asphyxiation, the blood pressure alone will cause there to be hemorrhaging and discoloration on the base of the skull. Well, I, I, as I said, it doesn't happen every time, but it, when it happens, it's, it, it, when the, the uh, blood decomposes, it leaves a residue, and the residue is colored. You were also asked by Mr. Ashton, sir, if you had sent the brain the, uh, matter, the, uh, he refers to it as dust, the sediment, for chemical analysis. And you response, you did not. No, I did personally not. I, do, I, I don't have the facility for that. You read all of the reports from the autopsy by Dr. Garavaglia, did you? Yes, I did. Right. Did you learn that, in fact, the matters from the autopsy were sent to Dr. Bruce Goldberger, a toxicologist in Gainesville. Objection, specification, what matters? Pardon? Relevance of specification of what matters. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. And did you read the results of the toxicology screens by Dr. Goldberger, sir? Yes, I did. Did Dr. Goldberger find the presence of any form of poison? No, he did not. Did he find the presence of any amount whatsoever of chlorophyll? Scope of cross. Overall. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Did he find the presence of any amount of chloroform? No, he did not. Now, the last issue Mr. Ashton was asking you about is the presence or location of duct tape, right? Yes. Do you know how many people had handled that skull before it was photographed in the medical examiner's office, sir? No, I do not. Do you have an opinion by looking at those photographs whether in fact of necessity that skull was manipulated to take the photographs. Well, it had to be manipulated. I mean, there's just no way that it was not, because manipulated means, manus in Latin means hand. So manipulated means that hands were laid on the skull. Why do I know that? Because it's positioned on a brown paper for the purpose of taking a picture. Well, the skull didn't walk there. The skull didn't go there. The skull was put there by hands of somebody. And in the process, the hair had to be rearranged. That's why the hair in the office, in the presence of the camera, looks somewhat different than the skull with the hair, with the position, placement of the hair uh, on the skull at the scene. 
There's just no other way. So somebody had to do it. Somebody had to do it, sure. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. No questions from the state. May the witness be excused. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this concludes the presentation uh, for evidence today. Uh, we will see you Monday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, please remember all of my other previous admonitions. Thank you. Okay, folks. So there will be no confusion about which order I was talking about. It was an order that was entered on January 6, 2011. Order granting state's motion for sanctions slash motion to compel, which specifies the requirements of reports, what are to be included in those reports. Uh, so let's make sure you reread that uh, in comply so we won't have uh, any more hiccups. Be prepared next Saturday to work, if necessary, up to 3 p.m. Uh, so I will probably let you know, uh, but uh, Going through one witness a day is not going to get us where we need to be. But at the same time, I'm not going to hurry you. We will just extend the working hours. So just be prepared uh, to work longer, long on Saturdays. And if necessary, we may extend the work hour uh, to 536 o'clock. But I'll make that evaluation at the close of business on Tuesday. Okay, any other matters we need to take up? From the defense? Okay, we'll be in recess to 9 a.m. Monday morning.